go. Ollie, it's great to have you on the show, my friend. It's great to be part of the show. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, I think you and I were doing some really brilliant work together, and I think your story um, is a really powerful one, and I think it's something that um, – it would be really valuable for other people to hear, especially with kind of, you know, the entrepreneurial pursuits that you're, uh, you know, that you already have and are, can, and are you know, keen to continue to undertake. Um, but um, I suppose, mate, do you want to give people a bit of a background of who you are, what, when, where, why, and um, we'll go from there. All right. So obviously I'm Oliver. I, I was born and grew up in Austria. Uh, my parents are initially from Hungary, so I grew up with two languages, Hungarian and um, German. Um, then, like, obviously finished high school and everything. I was in a dark space for a while, and then a, an opportunity came up um, coming to Australia to do university here which I pretty much took straight away. Then I came to Adelaide, finished university within four years, got a job offer on the Gold Coast, moved there, lived there for a couple of years, and then actually moved to Melbourne for another two years until I actually got into another dark spot, which probably was the hardest so far. So I um, lost my dad in September 2015 due to cancer. Um, a month later, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, lost her in June 2016. So there was only like nine months um, within them, mm -hmm. uh, within their, like within their deaths. Um, pretty much um, left Australia just in May 2016, just one month before my mom passed away. So I was actually there for the, I was actually there at the moment she passed away. So wow. I was there, thankfully for the last month, missed out um, doing that with my dad because everything just went way too fast. Yeah. But I was lucky enough to be in Europe like a month prior of his um, death because um, it was my brother's 40th birthday. Yeah, and um, stayed in Vienna, uh, tried to cope with the whole situation, um, went into a pretty destructive um, lifestyle and was diagnosed with skin cancer myself in um, January 2018, which now in retrospect, it was actually the best thing which could have happened to me. Like I re-evaluated my whole life. I um, found patterns I was um, doing, habits I was doing, which were like just um, not good for myself. Like I, I actually wasn't myself probably for my whole life. I'm now 36. And I'm, I can probably say that um, with 36, like I can be quite happy that that happened when I was 34, 33, because um, I wouldn't want to miss out on living like and realizing all this when I'm 70 and I don't have much time left. <laughs> <laughs> so that pretty much sums it up, I guess. <laughs> Dude, it, it is insane. Like that, 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 that double whammy of, of losing both, uh, you know, parents within nine months is, is, is just unbelievable. And I, I think like a lot of that stuff around trauma experience and, you know, moving into a destructive path is so easily validated, especially from the outside world looking in, you know, when you're in that destructive place, it's kind of like, Oh shit, you know, I'm such a bad person. I'm, I'm always fucking everything up. I'm never going to get anything right. But on the outside, it's like, well, of course you're going to find yourself in that space. Your world has been rocked upside down. You know, the carpet's been pulled from underneath, underneath your feet. Having that time to grieve and, um, you know, relying on others and just doing what you need to do to literally survive is, um, is something that I think everyone goes through and something that people need to recognize more as an inevitable reaction to something that's really painful. Yes, I mean, I can only acknowledge that because like that's, I mean, I learned more about like grieving, losing someone and like I went through different phases and like um, um, I guess that's what like made me realize as well how, how precious life is and how precious actually living to your purpose or living to your passions is instead of like just following certain habits or things like um, people put in your head that that's better for you or this is what you should study this is what you should do instead of going inside of yourself and like asking the questions like what do I actually want to do what is what makes me work what is what makes me happy etc etc 
How did you pull yourself out from that destructive position into starting to look at your life and being like, okay, I actually need to move on now. And part of the grieving process is in acceptance of this situation now. Well, as you pretty much said in the last sentence now, like um, it was more of accepting that my parents are gone. But saying that, like, I mean, your parents, like everything you have with people you lose, I guess, like it's never gone because they keep living in your memories as well. And if you can um, use that as, uh, as your strength, that they're not really gone. Like, I mean, there's all these positives which they actually made for me or they helped me with for like growing up and, and seeing them do and like appreciating things in the aftermath of uh, more or less. My mom was always big in like, like just a small example on like us going to like listening to classical music or going to an exhibition and um, see a Picasso or Monet exhibition. Mm. Like as a kid, as, as a kid, you don't appreciate that. But then like suddenly, like when I was living in Melbourne, I, there was this exhibition of Salvador Dali and I went there and then I just realized what my mom actually did with like all what she was doing, like growing up. And that's like still in my, in me. And that's mm. like, thanks to her. So I had to, I guess, first, I didn't want to accept the situation because you ask yourself questions. Why me? Why did both have to go? Why? Is it all happening at once? Like um, questioning yourself as well, like um, how I how you should keep living. What's what's home to you? I was living in Australia, like my roots were in Austria, but suddenly because you you lose your parents, like you pretty much the whole first feeling which comes to your head is like I lost my roots because yeah. that's what was that actually my parents actually made Austria my home. Mm. So you start even questioning like what is home to me? Yeah, and yeah. Um, how can I move on from this and how can I find the purpose again and, uh, and so on. But like, you have to accept the situation and just focus on yourself instead of like outside voices and stuff like, because like as, as soon as they passed away, like a lot of people say as well, their opinion about the situation as well, but like they don't know what you're going through. So like you try to do the best to your own terms and try to figure out all right what's the best way for me yes exactly right dude and uh, i think you said something really powerful there you said you know my sense of home was taken from me and i was wondering if you could kind of um touch on that you know because you and i have discussed that um to great yeah. depth but it's it's brilliant and um how did you start to construct a new home i actually i i <laughs> i mean <laughs> I guess your work really helped with it as well, because I, what you did with me, for example, writing down like how my day looks like oh, yeah. and what my, what, what my perfect day could look like, um, helped me as well, like finding home for myself, because I found like, it's not actually home where you are. It's home when you find purpose in yeah. working towards certain goals, which you're passionate about. And that's the reason I guess passions itself, like whether you have them as, as a kid, like, that's that's why it was important as well going back to the roots of like all right back when i was living at home with my parents when you all when you have that security of everything it's not the i guess it's never the place where you, what you call home that it's the yeah. place it's whether austria australia hungary whatever whatever country it is it is actually always within you and the people around you because my parents were the ones who made home to me so you can be the person as well who can choose and make the your own home within yourself as long as you like follow your your passions you have in your life mm. it doesn't need to be a certain place i think because a certain place is just like it's just a place at the end of the day but the people who surround you in that place they make what home is actually so that's what i realized mm. yeah dude and i love the way you say austria mate austria <laughs> exactly i'll be back <laughs> yeah, yeah oh very good very good pal <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked you to say that. I can't believe I've never asked you to say I'll be back. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I think you could become a come an actor, mate. I think I think there's a line there for you. <laughs> yeah. Hasta la vista, baby. So no, yeah. yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, man. <laughs> no, but you you're right. And you know, it's so hard like talking about these experiences, especially after you've been through the whole process, because you know, you and I have essentially just discussed 
what has been years in the making. It's like, oh, okay, you know, then I grieved and then I accepted it and then I, you know, moved on and started living a conscious, purposeful life. It's like, well, it obviously didn't happen like that. There's going to be ups and downs and setbacks and, you know, downfalls. And I, I was wondering if you could just walk us through that journey of just like, okay, awareness precedes the integration. So you get the awareness and you go, okay, I think, and even to a certain extent, you know, something that you and I discussed as well, it's like, how would your parents want you to live? You know, it's like, okay, they would want me to be all that I could be and be fulfilled and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to take that next step. And then you're motivated for like three days. And then the day four, you're like, ah, fuck this. I'm just going to order some chicken and just stay inside. Walk us through that journey, dude. Well, I mean, it, it's more or less a love as well. Like my parents always like um, try to teach us to be on our own two feet and like do whatever we are passionate about. But yep. at the same time, they had certain expectations in us. And I think that's like in like everyone has with their parents in a certain way. So like yep. it's whether you listen to them or whether you don't listen to them. And um, I mean, like as we discussed as well. So once I lost them, like I guess I was... Um, I was really looking for love somehow because the love your parents give you is suddenly gone. And that's, they're like, at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter like how old you are, your mm. parents are always a certain rock in your life, especially coming back to Austria. Like um, when I was living in Australia, like your mom, the first thing she's asking you, oh, what should I cook? To, you know, what should I cook? What should I prepare? What can I do for you? And then you just, she makes you feel home straight away when you get here suddenly all that stuff was gone. So yeah. um, I was obviously there for the death of my parents. And like the scary part was like when I was in hospital and my mom passed away, like obviously I started crying and everything, but I stopped myself crying. And the first thought I had was like, what do other people think of me now seeing me in the hospital crying? Wow. And that was like so scary to me because I realized like I gave more to the opinion of other people and what they could think that I could be weak, whatever, then like letting those feelings out, which is like the most natural thing. I mean, losing my dad was already hard enough and then losing my mom afterwards was even harder. Hmm. And obviously I tried to run away from the problem. I had my siblings in Austria and everything, but then like um, drugs become more interesting because um, that's where you find like for a certain amount of time, like a bit of like, like, I don't know, like your serotonin is going higher and you like feel happy for the moment, but then the day after you feel even worse than you did before. Yeah. And you, you realize in the process as well that it's not good for you, but you can't do anything against it because it starts to become a habit to run away from the problem. And that was the dark side. And like in my case, like that's the reason I'm seeing like skin cancer it was like, the best thing which happened to me is because that's what pulled me actually out of the hole. And I said like, nah, and I need to start thinking about what do I want from my life instead of keep living as a victim and not taking my, my life in my own hands, because that's what I all, that's all I did. I was just living as a victim. Wow. Um, and I, I, I blamed everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I uh, just made me think of something when you started saying drugs became more interesting and all that sort of stuff. And you're looking for that high, you know, especially with what we're talking about with, you know, your sense of home changes. Taking a drug is like your mum cooking you a schnitzel. You know, it's got the same like tone yeah. to it. It's like that warm oxytocin feeling, you know, you, you're building up through the dopaminergic system. You're feeling that warmth and connection. Um, yeah. And especially when you're in a place of grieving, it's kind of like, anything that remotely resembles that feeling is going to be instantaneously more attractive. Exactly. And I um, mean, that, that went for pretty much two years after the death of my parents. So that was actually a long time. So it was not a short time. Uh, thankfully, it was never like really like um, that bad that it like I took drugs, which I would have regretted to take, but it was always like, it was always there. And, the opportunity was always there as well. And once you have the opportunity, yeah. you just take it because like, ah, do I want to deal with my problem? You, you, pro you ask yourself for a second and then it's like, ah, oh, no, nah, fuck it. Like yeah. I'm just smoking some weed or whatever, like it is. Yes. And, like, and you numb yourself actually for the whole period of like that time. Like I did numb myself instead of like letting my emotions out and like whether I feel like screaming and like, or 
I don't know anything else as well. Like, I mean, just let things out. And like, I didn't even allow myself to cry, as I said, like not mm. after my mm. mom passed away in that moment, like through the months after I didn't let myself cry either because I wanted to be strong either for my little siblings or I didn't want it to show it. Like I want, I wanted to show the society more or less that like I'm, I'm working, like I'm still like, you're still f working and you're not like a mess, which yeah. you are at the end of the day. Well, you you're just a human. Like even yeah. this, this is like really good, important language here um, that I'm constantly trying to you know mediate as well. At what point do we say I'm a mess? Moreover, I'm just human. Like who the, who wouldn't be like that if they'd lost their parents within nine months? Like it's it's just you you actually have to be robotic, you know, to not you know to not cry or to not. You know, it's when we pathologize the aspects of the self that we're trying to suppress. That's, I, I believe, when the issue really manifests itself, when we say, oh, I shouldn't cry. It's like, well, yeah, there's a part in me that really needs to cry right now. You know, I need to let that out. Even what you said before, yell, scream. There's a part in me right now that really needs to yell and scream. Where's the closest pillow? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, just doing anything like that. But what was the, what was the, you said skin cancer was the best thing that ever happened to you. Was that kind of when you found out um, you had skin cancer? Was that the day one of making the positive change? It, 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 it was more or less. I mean, first of all, it was then like the cherry on top of the cake where I felt like, ah, fuck this as well. And like now yes. me and like, why did I deserve that? And then like what I realized, I guess, is like that um, your body sends your signs. Like, so like with keeping emotions in, keeping vulnerabilities in and not talk openly about what's going on in your life, that you are human and that you have those emotions, yep. especially losing your parents. If you don't let them out, your body, it's, it's like you're still like a bottle. Like you, 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 it's just like building up inside of you. And like your body just tries to get rid of it in some kind of way. And I've, I, I, built, I, I, I fought and skin cancer was all right. Like now I have to, tr like I have another choice. Like do I keep living the way how I am living or do I make a change and try to make things a bit better? And then like, it was not from day one, but then pretty much after that, like shortly after that, because it was two, two initial um, things with skin cancer. First I had it on my forehead. Um, and then they found the melanoma on my stomach. Wow. And the second, the second part when they found the melanoma, that was actually the one where like, I said like, nah, that's enough. Like now I stopped pretty much like literally like, um, any kind of drugs at that stage and thought like, nah, I need to like start to, um, live a healthier life and live more true, truthfully to myself. Mm. Yeah. Started meditating that helped me heaps for example. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a slow, slow burn. Hey, like it's, it's just day one. You know, I, I smoke 50 cigarettes a day. Day two, I smoke 49, you know? Yeah. It's like, you didn't, you didn't become like an enlightened Buddhist meditating monk after day one, you know? Uh, not at all. Like it was always this two, like it's like you have like two sides of yourself like there's like there's like like dr jekyll and mr hyde more or less <laughs> like you still yeah. have like you still have the old self of yourself inside of you which is like always trying to pull you back like because that was your habit for such a long time as well like i mean it was almost for two years all the habits which built up mm -hmm. and then you have like that new side which is actually want to break out but you don't know the direction, you don't know in what direction you should move. So it's like a kind of unknown as well. So of course you want to go back to your like so-called comfort zone. I mean, that was my comfort zone. So getting out of it is like the hardest bit. So like, um, so I tried to start like reading up, watching videos as well of like people who inspired me and then like implement certain habits and try to make it to my own habits, like taking a cold shower in the morning, every morning, like, like those little things which like made a massive imp and like they had a massive impact in the long run then like not mm -hmm. at the beginning because like every time you take a cold shower you think like fuck i just don't want to get in there yeah but then you get used to it yeah exactly yeah just dr jack or mr hyde you made me think like you've got dr schwarzenegger and mr schnitzel <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> and mr schnitzel is who you want to be but 
Dr. Schwarzenegger is <laughs> holding you back, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And but it, like it becomes that point when you hit that absolute low. We'll call him Dr. Schwarzenegger, but he's just he's 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 pushed you so far down that when you have hit rock bottom, it's like you can't push me any further now. I'm gonna run and have a look at what Mr. Schnitzel's talking about, you know? Um, yeah. And it's like now you have that chip on your shoulder, you have that guiding light because you've seen the darkness and the depth and now it's like, well, I wonder how bright and, 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 and fulfilling, you know, my life could be if I started to uh, do some things. And I think when you and I were doing a lot of the work around the cognitive schema, so, you know, structuring a point A, structuring a, a point B, it, it just makes it a whole lot clearer um, based upon, it's like, I know I should do this stuff, but it's like, why? Well, with the point B, this is who you could be and this is what you could be doing if you do that sort of stuff. So it just, it gives you a more tangible uh, guiding star, you know? Yeah. That's good. And it takes a long time. Well, it does because like, obviously there's certain things in you which are like manifested themselves for such a long time as well. And you start believing them yourself, even though like most of the time those things are not even true. But I guess that's when like those things like fear, like discomfort, they come in there. And like, because of fear, we don't step out of like certain comfort zones because like we're just scared of what other people might think of us, like coming back to that point or um, of rejection or of like other certain things. Like we are so scared of like um, outside factors. Um, and that actually is pretty sad in my opinion. Absolutely, man. And so when did, when did CrossFit, cause you and I met at a CrossFit gym. We met at CrossFit Richmond in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, how did CrossFit come into this game in terms of helping you um, grieve and accept? And then when did you start moving towards the entrepreneurial stuff? So, I mean, like CrossFit, like, yeah, that was always like, I mean, CrossFit, when I found it, like it, it pretty much helped me like, Oh, I liked it. Like functional fitness, like moving really fast. And the then ring. like, helps you with the yeah, ring. Exactly. <laughs> Wanting to get as big as Arnie, which never happened, but maybe <laughs> it's still like happening in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, but then like I kept working, like obviously like trying to keep fit. And then like the thing with my parents happened and actually like um, on a positive note, like CrossFit was the thing. Like even when I came back to Vienna, like I still went training. I actually, because CrossFit is like a little bit about the community as well. Like you get along with a lot of people. You talk to a lot of people. Once my parents passed away, I, it was CrossFit was for me. Like I went to the gym did the one hour workout and went home. I didn't really communicate much with people. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have much contact. I didn't want to tell anyone what I'm going through or like show what I'm going through. Or like, I didn't want any pity more or less, but it's still like, even though I was destructive, like CrossFit was still there as like, it kind of keep me in a way sane because like I kept my workout regimes up even though like I wasn't doing well. But then, like, obviously, the change came with skin cancer, and I thought, like, ah, oh, now I have to get fully back into it. I mm. put myself goals, and I started, like, <laughs> what drugs were for me before CrossFit became after. So it pretty much became a drug. I started overtraining. I started training too much. I didn't listen to my body. I injuries one after another came up, and then you start questioning again. Yeah, but I want to train, but I don't sleep enough. I don't eat right. I do this wrong and stuff. Like I need to implement, like you always look at outside factors instead of listening to your body and knowing I, I should take a rest day. I should look way more on my recovery. And that's when the entrepreneurial thought came in as well, because um, I thought like we focus so much on like our workouts and everything, but actually like even being part of a community you don't know what the guy or the girl next to you is going through in their life what stress they're facing what what what, what like and then like i thought like well focusing more on like recovery like because it's as important as doing the actual workout especially when you sit nine hours in the office and then you come and do a one hour workout and you want to go full mental and destroy that workout yeah. and you realize yeah, well i'm 36 it doesn't work that way anymore 
but um, that's the reason when recovery comes in. That's where yes. well nutrition, like um, certain things um, you do to, 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 to help yourself to recover better so you're able to smash some workouts. Mm. And that's what I had to learn. And if I wouldn't have had the injuries, I wouldn't have come up with this stuff because like, it just showed me like it's, a, it's the other thing again. Your body sends you signs when it's, something is too much, when you overtrain. And like it starts with like a small aching in your like whatever wrist in your elbows, tendonitis, best example. So many CrossFitters have it, and then it creeps up on you suddenly. Like, well, the pain is getting bigger, and like your recovery obviously takes longer. But you always want to know. I need to go back to the gym because I, I want to get that PB in like my back squat or whatever it is. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's just so fascinating hearing your uh, journey. You know that you. The CrossFit was the coping strategy to deal with the pain of the traumatic experience of losing your parents. But then what you needed to do was you needed to come up with a business and you, you did so, uh, you know, just through your own will to deal with the coping strategy. You know, and this is something that we discussed together, but having a business to deal with a coping strategy that is used and will be used whilst other people are moving through a specific pain is so relative and so important because you know addiction isn't just a drug you know it's sex it's porn it's food it's yeah. narcissism you know it's crossfit it's anything that is used to escape mask medicate as a guys you know and where your business come in, comes in and i'd love for you to talk about this more but impactful athletics as a recovery tool to help people deal with the pain of the coping strategy that's trying to deal with the pain. Yeah. It's exactly. crazy, but it's so powerful. I mean, and that's like, um, I mean, like I, I started Impactful Athletics with a really good friend of mine, Louis, and like uh, we, had the, we had the same ideas. And because he was training with me and he went through <laughs> similar things in like in recovery work, like we just understood the, the problems which there are and like, getting bringing it closer to people so they so they are able to recover and still face life to the fullest and like whatever reasons there are why they why they're training because they want to be playing more with their kids or they want to be going hiking and um, do things they love doing or they do it because they want to be like stronger musclier there are so many different um, reasons why people train but um like there, there comes where whatever you go through in your life, like recovery, sports, it's it's important, but you shouldn't use it as your mechanism of like running away from the problem because yeah. the problem is still there. Like, so for some reasons, like I, I just like another example as well, like whether whether something is going wrong in your life. First things, like when my mom passed away, like the first thing which popped up in my head just was like, ah, shit, I, I will go back to Australia straight away. I'm actually so happy that I didn't go back to Australia straight away because I would have just run away from the problem. The problem would have been still there. It doesn't matter where you go. Like, even if you change cities, like like um, couples do it in relationship as well. Ah, if you move to that city, like everything will be better. Instead of like communicating to each other and saying like, ah, this is the problem. We need to face this problem moving to another place doesn't change anything unfortunately but we hope for that change because yeah because that would be the easy way out yes but you know all we do is bring the problem with us <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so you, you can hope that you know the relationship issues will go away once you start living in rome or uh, vienna <laughs> but you're just going to bring it along <laughs> exactly it, it doesn't uh, matter really. so so talk to us about um impactful athletics what is it um you know what do you sell what's what's the big vision so i mean impactful athletics is like an idea which was obviously born as like so we want to um write program programmings for people so they can um do exercises they love doing it's crossfit based but it's a lot of um, endurance body weight stuff and we focus a lot on recovery as well and like the, the things we just um uh, were talking before about is like I came up with the idea then as well that like, oh, let's, let's bring in like people who work in other industries and try to help people like physiotherapists, naturopaths, and work together with them to develop a programming which works in recovery. 
So like whether it's like awareness, consciousness, whether what exercises are the best so you, 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 your longevity is given and like you can train on a on hundred percent most of the time um, and not getting injured. And then like, it's like, I mean, like as the name say, we want to, we want to generate through that an impact. So like, it, it doesn't take much effort to generate impact and we want to bring that closer to people as well. So like we kind of want to form a community. So impactful athletics, the, 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 the big idea is like to form a community where people are, are, becoming the best versions of themselves and that's like where for example like things like you do as well like come into like um what we're doing because like you're working on like the the mindfulness of people on like working through trauma and like um you want to get the best potential you want you are helping people to get their potential out of them and that's I guess that's the, the big idea. Like we all live um, a life and wearing so many masks in so many different situations where we're not even aware anymore that we're wearing a mask because um, we, it's just became a habit to us like we have to behave in certain situations like that. And we want to change that so people can show their vulnerabilities. Like I want to tell my story as well, what happened to me instead of hiding, like I said, when I went to CrossFit, like not saying anything. It doesn't matter how many times you hear, I'm so sorry that, to hear that, et cetera, et cetera. It, that doesn't make a difference, but like you get out there and maybe there's other people out there who will go through similar traumatic experiences. And if you're able to help them, and it doesn't even have to be like losing your parents. It can be like the smallest thing that you're like completely stressed at work or you don't love doing your job anymore or you want to just step out or you're unhappy in other areas of your life. So, yeah. Absolutely, man. It's how can you use your story for good? You know, how can you harness the power of it? Because what we don't want to do, and I said this before, but we don't want to pathologize the, 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 the self and divide it. You know, that's what trauma does. It leaves an aspect of the self behind in the past because it can't integrate what happened, you know, whether it's because of the shame or the fear or the pain or the anger. But when we talk about um, integrating and, as you say, um, fulfilling potential and all that sort of stuff. We want to try to bring everything along with us for the journey and recognize that those experiences, those experiences made us who we are today. We wouldn't be who we are without those experiences, warts and all. And it's so important for us to look back on the past with a sense of gratitude because without it, we'll stay there. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really what we believe. Yeah, sorry. I was just, I was just going to say, but I think that's what you're doing, especially with your entrepreneurial pursuit. You know, you've, you've started a business that's conscious, that's directed towards people that are probably at day one of where you were, you solved the problem. And now you want to help other people shortcut that strategy so they don't have to deal with as much pain as you went through. Exactly. Because I believe as well that like every obstacle is an opportunity. So there is a yeah. lot of obstacles and like, unfortunately, like losing your parents, or losing a loved one in general, that's an obstacle as well. Like, but it's, it's, it's up to us, like what choice we make. Do we live as a victim or do we step out and still try to make the best out of life? I mean, like if I would have lived as a, as a victim, like being 34 and always lived as a victim, like until the end of my life, I would have wasted probably 40 years, if not more of my life. Yeah. And that's like, that have been pretty sad. So like, that's the reason it's so, that, 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 that's an opportunity. And I was able to go back and like, oh, look, that's like, that's my passions. Like I always wanted to work with people, but um, I did it in a different field. And that's the reason I changed. I went back to uni as well. And I'm studying just to get more information of like how I can improve people's life. Mm -hmm. And it became so powerful to me. So there is another opportunity for me. Yeah, and you're improving yourself as you go. Mate, um, yeah, this has been brilliant. We, we always uh, said that we do a podcast together, and I think now that we have, I think it's been really good. And the vulnerability just, um, you know, spills through the microphone. So it's really good, man. And I've loved working with you as well, just by the way. It's been brilliant to work with a friend um, and a mentor as in many ways too, you know, just – you know, you talking to me about your story has really helped, um, you know, professionally and personally as well, man. So it's been great. Um, 
where can people find you? And um, maybe you can plug Impactful Athletics as well because I think it's really important, especially in this day and age. So obviously, like I, I'm on Facebook and um, uh, Instagram. Mr. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I should put that on my Instagram post from now onwards. <laughs> <laughs> Just in like the explanation. That's Oliver Bogner, Mr. Schnitzel. <laughs> the Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh God, that's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, like so on Facebook, Oliver Bogner, um, Instagram, Oliver Bogner, and then like Impactful Athletics is on Instagram as well. Uh, um, so we, I'm pretty much like anybody can find me there. Brilliant. And yeah, we get more like um, stuff out there as well. Yes, absolutely. Bogner, B O G N A R. Exactly. Brilliant. Ollie, mate, we got through it. Such a pleasure. Awesome. Same. I actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. Mate, you should start your own one. The Mr. Schnitzel podcast. <laughs> that would be actually a good idea. Was I had it already in my hand. I had, and you know how I get to this. Um, yeah, maybe like Mr. Schnitzel podcast would be the name of Mr. That. Schnitzel. <laughs> Welcome to the Schnitzel podcast. That'd be awesome, dude. <laughs> All right, mate. Beautiful. Thanks so much. And uh, peace, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>